Hey everyone, welcome to another Machinations webinar. Uh, today we have expert club member, our guest, Ioana, who will be talking about the work they're doing over at MojiWorks with Snapchat and hypersocial games. So I'm very excited. This was a presentation Ioana actually gave at another conference, but we were able to turn it into a panel discussion and integrate machinations into it. And so it, it should be very fun. Um, Ioana, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly and go through like the, the intro and then we can kick it off. Is that okay? Sounds great. Thank you. So machinations is like we said, going to be talking about designing games for young millennials and Gen Z and specifically focused on hypersocial games. So in this webinar, we're going to cover three main topics, insights into social gaming and behaviors of the younger generation, how they, how they, as in MojiWorks, design their games with community input. And we're going to be doing a, a deconstruction on some parts of their game, Ready Chef Go. I'm Mohammed. I handle game design relations at Machinations IO. I'm a game designer myself. I come from a game design background, and this is why I love these fruitful discussions where we get to delve into the nitty gritty and deconstruct some really interesting games. And uh, Ioana, can you give us a brief intro? I know your presentation has a much more detailed introduction, but for now we can just do like a quick brief one. Uh, yes, so uh, my name is Ioana Kazaku. Nice to meet you. Uh, I have around like, five years of experience in the mobile sector and I now have about four into this specific style of mobile games which is chat based games um I've been working with MojiWorks for my for like the better part of my career um and I went from like we went from exploring the landscape to basically having a very successful game on Snapchat and that's what I'm gonna pretty much talk to you about and what we discovered from having that successful game. So, um, hello, this is Hypersocial, designing games for young millennials and Gen Z. Um, you might have heard of the term hypersocial, you might have not. Uh, I will endeavor to explain to you what that term means and how we build it up, because as far as I'm aware, we are the first ones to use it. So even if you've heard it somewhere else, it was us who coined it the first time. Um, ooh. Interesting. So I like to give an overview of what the presentation is, but um, we just discussed that earlier. So I'm not gonna go into much detail. Uh, we're gonna cover some statistics to begin with, just because it's nice to see some numbers. And then I'm gonna tell you what hypersocial games are in case you haven't heard of them. I'm gonna use the game that we made and as an example of what hypersocial is. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you how we listen to player, and then we're going to go into the interesting stuff that we do with machinations and how we test our ideas before we put them out. So hello. Um, I like to put emojis on everything, so you would see my face everywhere. I have them even on a cushion behind me, so be prepared. Um, so as I said, my name is Iwana, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am Romanian, represent. Um, <laughs> I have a degree in uh, in game design. I'm actually also teaching game design this year. Um, I believe that games are art. I think multiplayer is awesome. And I have a very good emoji game, which is also going to be apparent from this presentation, I hope. Uh, you can rate me on that at the end. Um, so what does MojiWorks do? So MojiWorks started as uh, a company who wanted to do native games for chat platforms. In the beginning, that meant um, iMessage because iMessage was the first platform to integrate games. Um, and they actually, this was before I joined them, uh, they created a game that was very successful, which we still get tickets from these days, uh, even though we haven't worked on it in years. Um, the company has been going uh, for uh, going on for around five plus years, uh, and we've been doing pretty good. Um, and we released Ready Chef Go on Snapchat in, at the end of 2019. Um, I want to say it was the 18th of December, uh, which was really the best, uh, the best Christmas present we could have done for ourselves because this game has to date uh, 75 million players on Snapchat. Um, and we actually have two successful games on Snapchat now because we released globally our trivia game and we keep on developing for them. 
Uh, these days, we are pretty much exclusively working with Snapchat, but that doesn't mean that in the future we won't work with other platforms. So to get straight into it, uh, we know for a fact that millennials and Gen Z have kind of different social media habits to their other generations. And when we talk about millennials and Gen Z, it's kind of an interesting uh, discussion because the banding for the different generation is actually pretty difficult. Um, Snapchat, which is our main platform now, it's actually like 13 to around 25. Um, but in reality, it's not 13 to 25 because uh, the, the lower age is 13. But, you know, a lot of kids will say that they're 13 in order to get on Snapchat and so on. So we're looking at the younger generation and sort of like the, the lower uh, part of millennials. Um, so what do they do? Uh, we know they spend a lot of time on social media and by day I mean we. Uh, <laughs> so 4.5 hours a day on social media. That does include things like TikTok. Uh, it's considered a social media. Um, but that's a lot of hours, 4.5 hours. Um, pretty impressive. Uh, they use it to do a wide variety of things. So these apps are no longer just communication apps or just like getting in touch with your friend from high school. They do a lot of things. Um, so this is why I have this like handy dandy chart that it's actually from January, 2021. Um, I'm sure they're gonna release a new one, uh, but for now, this is the most up-to-date that I could find. Um, and the survey says that uh, obviously the most coveted thing on social media, it's entertainment nowadays. And then the second one is keeping in touch with your friends and then getting inspiration and stuff like that. Um, and you can see how the Gen Z tend towards this entertainment slash like connecting with friends side of things with quite significantly larger percentages than the millennials do. Um, so we know we know they love to connect with friends on social media and the way they connect is actually through entertainment, which is quite interesting and i'm going to touch on that later. Um, and we also know that they're active on more than one uh, of these social medias and they use them differently with different people and they they basically have different personas for each of these different social medias like. On Instagram, you're trying to appear in a certain like aesthetic way. On Snapchat, you may have like close friends and like you're a bit sillier. On Facebook, you communicate with your mom and dad because Facebook is not cool anymore or something, etc. So there was a thing that we analyzed, and it's interesting because obviously now we feel like we're going on to the tail end of this, but COVID-19 changed a lot of things. Um, and it actually, for us, from, from our perspective, they actually didn't change as much ac accelerated trends that were already happening previously. So uh, we know for a fact that there is an increase in playing games on social media. Uh, there was a surge in playing games on social media in the early like 2010s with uh, Facebook games. Those were like, really popular. And then the popularity of that went straight down. But now we know that playing games is going like significantly up. Like you can see here from 38 to 60 percent. That's a huge, huge jump. And that's uh, that's due to also like integration of games in the, into this newer social medias, but also the fact that they had to find a way to connect with their friends. Um, also, both millennials and Gen Z cite social media as a main way to play video games, which is interesting because Obviously, bigger things like consoles and <laughs> PCs exist, but that's not um, that's something that maybe is not accessible to most people. So uh, what can we do with that? Um, I'm going to tell you, hopefully. Um, and connecting online with friends has become the new social activity and pretty much the most important social activity because there was no whole lot of other ways. And we saw a lot of ways of communicating with friends, like uh, the virtual um, play spaces where people could join and have in-person meetings virtually. Um, and those are definitely an interesting topic, but people try to find a ways in which they could feel together, even though they were apart because of the pandemic. Now, this is something that we noticed in it was kind of interesting because we were surprised by that aspect of our game. Like we were expecting it will be 
a way for people to communicate with each other and connect, but we weren't expecting that strongly of a response. And obviously, because we launched at the beginning of uh, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, when the pandemic came, it was it was kind of the right moment, uh, which was interesting. So you can see here more statistics on what people do more and what people do less um, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, another interesting bit of this is that, um, and this is about games in general, as an opportunity is that we can tell we can see that uh, Gen uh, Z and millennials play games than they do any other activity. Um, even like surprisingly so, even more than like watching TV shows and TV and you know engage in other kinds of social activity. So they they play games and they listen to music pretty much, and that occupies a lot of their time, um, which is is definitely interesting. Uh, I'm not going to endeavor to read this entire quote for you because it's a it's a pretty beefy quote and it just says what I just said, but it's uh, I'm sure you can go back and read it or you might have read it as I just said that. So we know this is a, actually a Snapchat research that they've done. So we know that the people our players love gaming. So what they say is like one in two Snapchat generation, which is just their way for saying like their main target for Snapchat users. Um, they agree that gaming is a productive activity, which is very interesting. So they're not just playing to waste time. They think it's a productive activity, which I think is fantastic. Um, and they're more likely to, to think so than someone who is not necessarily a Snapchat because they're outside of that. Um, that demographic. I thought this was interesting. Um, they don't think of these games as shallow. They don't think of them as like eating time or wasting time. Uh, I think for a long time, we thought of mobile games as like the games you play while you commute. Um, and that's definitely not the case with these games. They play them with purpose and they think of them as a good activity to do. So out of that, we kind of gathered from their usage of Snapchat as we know it and their usage of our games, we gather that there is definitely a using games as nonverbal communication bit in there, which is definitely super interesting for us. So we definitely know that people uh, all around social media, they send like photos and memes and like videos and all sorts of stuff um, as a way to connect with people sometimes. Um, they don't even like say anything. They just send the meme because they think you like it. So we think that this back and forth of entertainment content, it's actually a new way of saying, I saw this and I thought of you. Um, it's the virtual version of going to a market, seeing a little object that reminds you of your friend and buying that to give to them. This is how um, we think uh, happens. So we noted that our audience uses games like this. Um, how? Um, well, so we try to make the content that appears to uh, appeals to a wide audience. And we did this so that when someone wants to share it, if it appears as relatable content. Um, and that was crucial when it comes to, to game, to the game that we made. Uh, a way that we ensure to do that is to have multiple cuisines in the game because it's a game about cooking, obviously. So um, let's say that we introduce a new region, regional cuisine and then someone thinks of their friend is like, hey, this is this is the kind of food that you were you, you made us when you came around or something like that. Um, we have a very low barrier for entry so everyone can play it. You don't have to be you don't even have to have played games before to be able to play the game. Um, and when we do design, we rely more on people's, on people's shared experience of life, then we rely on their shared experience of video games. Um, because a lot of games can be quite meta. You're like, oh, most people have played Mario, so you know that they're gonna go to the right and that's gonna be the first thing. And then there's the whole thing with like, oh, but what if we subvert expectations? Our expectations are of them is that they haven't played a game before. So how can we use real life in order for them to understand our game on a glance. 
Um, we use it as a virtual space for, pre for friends to hang out. Um, and I'm going to go into these, this later, but basically what we try to do is each of the players has an avatar and they are together in a virtual space, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but that's not a lot of, a lot of the multiplayer happening on mobile doesn't really look like that. It's one of the reasons why something like Among Us was so popular, because even if it was like a simple avatar, you were in the same space and it felt amazing, right? Um, we try to go for mechanics that allow players to interact with each other. So like emoting, and helping out and strategizing, but keeping it pretty easy so that um, they don't have to like think about it too much. Uh, they have easy access to chat tools because we are in Snapchat and the nature of the platform is that you can talk to whoever you want. Um, and they already have access to their friends because they're in a list of their friends. That's how they play the game. They don't have to go online and add someone and, you know, all of that. So kind of the game was a perfect storm on the, of the platform it was on and us trying to make it so that it's something relatable and easy to share so that people see it as that sort of nonverbal communication, easy to share kind of game. So what are hypersocial games? Well, the way I think we like to think about it is uh, they're kind of a, a mix between the social games that used to be on Facebook in like 2010, but with the ease of use of like a hypersocial game, hyper casual game. So you're trying to make something that it's easy and catchy, but also keeps the connection in the like social aspect of Facebook games, all Facebook games. So uh, we have a few things that we were looking at, and we decided that these are the main things that make a, a game hypersocial. So it has to be easy to drop in and out. It has to have an easy and intuitive mechanic that you can get on, on the spot without having to like go through tutorials. Uh, it has to have some sort of light touch multiplayer, and I will explain to you what that actually means. Um, you have to be connected but not intrusive. So let people connect with the game and with their friends as much as they want to. Don't force them to do it more than they want to. And you have to stay relatable and inclusive because you're trying to appeal to such a large audience, including people that don't know about games or don't know about certain things. So make it for everyone, pretty much. Um, this is the first part um, of the talk and I'm happy to take some questions now. I have one. So um, you're talking about, uh, you know, the the expectation of when you guys build a game or design a game, you treat it as if players haven't played the game before. Yes. And naturally, you must be focused a lot on usability, um, especially at the top of the funnel. But when it comes to designing the first time user experience, can you give us some best practices? Yes, actually, <laughs> this is going to sound really, uh, really strange. So we tried so many versions of a first time user experience and every single time, like we ran countless A-B tests and in our specific environment, the, the more, the closer the first time user experience is to the actual gameplay experience that you're going to have over time, the better. Our players are not going to sit through like characters telling them what to do. You can't get them to tap here or tap there. That's just not going to happen. Um, you basically lose them as soon as you don't put them in a real match. So even though it sounds like it's super daunting, the best numbers we've ever had was to take the player from the Snapchat menu straight into a real match against another person, which was not our expectations at all. Um, we were all thinking like, oh, it's, it might be too overwhelming because like you don't know how to use the game. You don't know how to do anything about it. And then you're being put against this like real person to play against them. Uh, but actually, when we tried a rigged version with uh, like an NPC instead of a real human, uh, that didn't work very well. Everyone was like, oh, it's too slow. It's boring. Like, I don't like it. And the numbers, like even the, the analytics, just they, they didn't go well. So 
the first time user experience for us is basically like at best a slightly slimmed down version of the real experience in the same way that with hyper hyper casual games you get what a hyper casual game is from the ad like you don't have to really think about it too much and i think it's the same is the same with us like instantly i i go into the game and i want to know how to play it i might not be very good at playing it but i'm not going to not know what to do and i think that's probably the best for us yeah that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a question from the audience, which is, you know, things can be relatable differently between cultures. So how do you find something that's universally relatable? Uh, that is very interesting question. So we actually don't, we don't try to find something that is universally relatable, because I think that's actually pretty difficult. What we do is we have, so we have our main market, which for Snapchat, for the numbers of Snapchat, it's actually the US. So when we create something, we do tend to create it with a US centric view, but also if we create content for a different part of the world, which we had, and I'm gonna to touch upon it later on in the, in the presentation, we, because Snapchat is such a big company, we actually work with the local branch of Snapchat to create something that is good for that social situation so we actually made a game mode called dosa dash uh, which is set in india for their indian um like promotion they did a campaign and we worked with them to make sure that it's like it's uh fun and like it, it has all the right like social cues and it it's it's a good experience for everyone um we found that actually um the kind of people that play our games tend to be pretty open to things that they're not super like variety. They like variety a lot. So uh, our American players that might have never even like had Indian cuisine, when we put Dosa Dash out, we got a lot of positive feedback from them because they learned about something that they didn't know about previously. So um, that's that's basically so we in long short for that is we don't try to appeal everyone at the same time we have a core market and then if we have a marketing campaign or something specific for a specific region we work with someone from that region to help us out awesome so we actually have another question which is could you give us an example of use real life in designing a game for someone not experienced with the language of video games Yes, so that this is something uh, that we we tried to. It was actually something that we experimented with in the beginning. So our game started off as a pizza making game, um, and the problem that became apparent very quickly it was that it wasn't really clear what was on top of the pizza because of the angle of the game and sort of like how far it was. So instead, we we ended up making burgers as our main food because they were so simple and pretty much like even if you don't eat burgers you know how a burger is made so you have a, a raw patty and then you put it on the grill to cook it and then you put it in a bun <laughs> like you don't have to be a you don't have to be specifically versed in that and also uh, burgers are uh, appealing that main market that i was talking about so most people around the world, but especially in America, would have had the experience of seeing how a burger is made. Um, and they don't need to be told that you need to cook raw meat in order to like put it in a bun and serve it. Um, we also like try to use like big icons and stuff. I'm gonna go into that lower down when I explain how we did all of this, but yeah. So we try to we try to be very visual and simplify things as much as possible. Got it. Yeah, uh, I think these are all the questions we have. We can uh, continue with the with the presentation. Awesome. So, uh, Ready Chef Go. Uh, Ready Chef Go is our first game that we ever made for Snapchat. Uh, as I said, we uh, started somewhere in early 2019 uh, when the platform was just emerging. I think. They made uh, the Snapchat game platform available at the beginning of 2019, and then 
we were in the second group of um, games that was put on the platform. Um, we global launched it in December 2019, and it really exceeded our expectations, um, especially coming from other platforms, which didn't have as impressive numbers. Um, and then in 2020, the pandemic hit, which meant that a lot of people used our games to stay in touch. And actually, um, we have this wonderful thing that I can't, I, I, will, I don't think I'll ever get sick of. Uh, we have a bot that takes all of the tweets about our game and puts them in Slack. Um, and we just keep on seeing people like talk about our game. Um, and one of my favorite uh, like tweets of all time is this girl like thanking us that um, we put this game out because I think it was either her like dad or granddad that was living in Italy and she was living in the US and they were using this game as a way to like stay in contact. Um, and I thought that was just like really sweet and super magical. Um, and we always get this kind of, um, messages from them, which are super heartwarming. And really, that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, and in 2021, which is when I could get this figure from, because I can't update this figure all the time, um, about a year and a half in, we got 75 million people as playing Chef. Uh, I'm sure that there's more by now, but we don't update these all the time. So I don't know exactly how many. <laughs> so how does hypersocial appear in Ready Chef Go. And this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Uh, we use this easy intuitive mechanic. Um, so you can see here on the side some of our recipes. At the top is our dosa recipe, um, where we try to use like clear shapes for the different things. Uh, at the bottom, you can see our sushi recipes. Um, so what, we, what do we do? We use the uh, universal experience of food so most of the time, what we try to do is pick foods that most people would have had or have some sort of understanding of how they're being made. Um, if they are specific to a region, we put a little bit more work into like trying to make them visually distinct. And uh, these step-by-step um, -step instructions are actually something that you can see in the loading screens in the game. So if you're ever in doubt about how to do certain things, these appear as like tooltips. Um, and it's all very visual. We don't use like pointers or text or anything like that. Um, we try to simplify all cooking to a maximum of four steps. Uh, and four steps means like actually like picking up and putting down something. Um, we don't have anything more complicated than that. And we try to have more complicated than that, but it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't flow as well. Um, and we also use distinctive shapes and colors, as I said. A good example of that, it's actually the dosa thing at the top. So um, I didn't know this, but when we did the work on dosa dash, uh, it turns out that plain dosas get folded into this like cone shape. Um, and then when they have the, the masala inside, they actually get folded like in half. So this was an interesting one for us because we were like, oh, clearly that's something we can use. So you can see by the shape what the purpose of that thing is. So even if they're like from afar, they're not super distinct. The silhouette of it tells you more about the, the dish than anything else. Um, yeah, so this is how we try to keep it super simple, super intuitive um, and quick to play. And this, this is something that we, <laughs> we went on and on about discovering. So we have this philosophy of easy to drop in and out, which is, I mean, how do we end up with that? Um, initially, when we started making this game, we had a lobby system like you would expect to have in a multiplayer game. So it was a thing where your friends can join you and then once all of your friends have joined you, you go into like a matchmaking pool. And then once everyone has agreed, <laughs> you can go ahead into like a player versus player match. Um, I also haven't actually told you how this game works, I realize now. So uh, the, the main crux of British Chef Go is that it's team versus team. So it's 
you cooking together with your friends against another team that are cooking together and your scores get tally up and whoever gets the the, the biggest score in the time given wins. Um, so we tried for fairness sake, we tried all sorts of different configuration of waiting for your friends, having a lobby, waiting for them to like get together, um, like spectating everything that you can think of when it comes to multiplayer, like all of the traditional multiplayer trappings. Um, and none of it seemed to really work for us. Uh, so instead what we did is we made it all super free um, with dynamic team sizes. So basically you can join your friend at any point. They can be in the lobby doing upgrades. They can press play and they're already in matchmaking, but you can do it. You can join them during matchmaking. You can join them during the match, even if there's like 20 seconds left. You can join them during the like celebration at the end where they're getting like loot from what they've won. Um, the only thing that we do is that we adjust the values that you make based on how many people are in the in the game. So it actually ends up being pretty much equal. Um, and we did this because basically we realized that most people spend around a minute in this game. And they don't want to. They don't want to wait around for their friends to finish a match, and they don't want to spectate their friend. They want to join their friend, um, and they might do that at any any time. Um, so even though it's, it sounds like it's a counterintuitive approach, it was it was the best way for us to to do it. Um, and I stand by that decision because it, it definitely makes the game better, um, not having to wait for anyone. Um, is this when we're taking a break for more question? Yeah, after this slide. Oh okay, man, amazing. So, um, uh, another thing that we care about is this light multiplayer interaction. <clears throat> and, uh, this is another story of trying out a load of things, uh, until finding the right thing to do. So initially what we did was you had a shared environment. So it's pretty much like Overcooked, right? It was a shared kitchen, a shared environment and whatever I did, you could, you could see. So if I picked something up, you could see it in my hand. And if I put something down, you could see it like on the counter or on the stove. And that's how it used to work and everything was synchronous. Uh, now, obviously that is also a strain on the like, back end of things but that was not the main reason why we didn't go with that the main reason why we didn't go with a completely synchronous environment is because in in a small kitchen like this and with such a fast type of gameplay your friend was always in your way and actually having them in there made it so annoying to play <laughs> that you wouldn't want someone with you the best way to play was by yourself so something that we initially we were quite skeptical of, but then we came around to do was, oh, actually we can, the kitchen bit can be personal. So I don't see what you're cooking and you don't see what I'm cooking unless it's holding, like I'm holding it in my hand, but the customers are shared. So um, basically I can make a food you're never going to see me make this food, uh, except for when I'm holding it. And I can give it to a, a customer and that takes off that part of the order. And then I can, I can help my friend in that way without getting stepping on each other's toes. Like we don't need to share uh, like grills. We don't need to like worry about each other. We just need to make sure that we serve the customers and they come in. Um, and that allowed us to have a, very nice flowing um, gameplay without having the stress of having to collaborate with someone real time. Because you have to remember, while there is actually a voice feature for Snapchat, the most common way that people will communicate is through text. And the last thing you want to do during a like time management cooking game is to text someone 
it was just not working out. So um, this is this was our solution that we came to after extensive uh, extensive research. So yeah, uh, I'm happy to take some more questions now. We have a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is when it comes to, you know, dropping in and out and mm -hmm. not being a very frictionless experience, mm -hmm. how does that affect retention and churn? That's very interesting. We actually found that, so if you mean by, does this make the game unfair, unfair for the other team and therefore that makes them quit? Um, in that way, we never seen any problem with that because um, another thing that you can probably see in here is that your um, your opponents are not actually visible on screen. It's only your kitchen and your stuff. And the only way that you can see what the others do is through this bar at the top. And we actually do some clever stuff to like hide if people come in. <laughs> Uh, on the other side, so that you don't, you don't, you basically don't know. Uh, it balances it out by itself, and you're you're playing against these people, but you don't know exactly like how many and when, uh, unless they were there from the beginning. Um, in terms of like whether or not it it helps people, it definitely keeps them in because something that we found, and this is something that I'm probably going to go in a little bit later we have this thing which is called a responder and a responder is basically the player that gets a notification from their friend that they have started playing this game which they get automatically through snapchat and responders have a far higher attention to the game in general not only in that first session but just like they're more likely to stick around and play the game even after the first person who invited them in left already <laughs> so um yeah that's uh, I think I think it definitely like being in there with your friend is it's such a strong pull. And we also realize that it it kind of teaches you what to do because your friend is already in there and they're doing a thing and you you follow their example. Um, yeah, it's it's been hugely beneficial for us um, and being able to join them immediately without faff or waiting. That's even better. Awesome. So. Uh... Another question we have is, what do you think uh, Ready Chef Go's biggest contribution to the genre is? Yeah, this is an interesting question, right? Because I think we, we haven't reinvented the wheel. <laughs> we just kind of took two genres and we kind of like mashed them together. So we all know that Overcooked is like, it's huge and it's really fun. And to be honest with you, we took a lot of inspiration from Overcooked. Um, the difference obviously is that it takes some sort of like mobile game philosophy. And if you think things like Dino Dash or like Cooking Craze or things like that, we mix the, the genres between like the mobile, the mobile friendly cooking game time mechanics and the sort of like intense collaborative overcook experience making something that can be played on mobile um and obviously it's all it's all about circumstances right um a game like this um would not be as fun on a pc because that's not the point is it's a product of where it is and who you're playing it with so i think um in that way it allows the major contribution is that it allows people that don't have overcooked and don't have a pc or a console to play a game that is it is a very intense time management cooking game um, and they can do it in an experience that is seamless for the device they're playing on um oh well, i hope that's 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 my hope <laughs> i don't know um yeah yeah, so we're getting a few questions about things I'm not sure if you'd be able to share, which is insights regarding spectating versus playing with friends. Uh, I actually probably can't. I actually don't know off the top of my head either. I just know that we've made that decision at the time. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know exact numbers. Um, when, when we looked at features, this was the better feature. That's what we chose. Um, and another thing, which is game design pillars. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> we actually, it's interesting, right? Because we started developing this game <clears throat> very, very early on onto our experience with Snapchat. It was our first games making it. And actually the pillars of the game changed as we were making the game. We started off with, um, with ones and then we ended up with the others. Uh, one of the pillars that we have and we keep for all of our games is that it has to be seamless with the Snapchat experience. So it doesn't feel like some sort of strange add-on thing. Um, and another very important one that goes across our game is that we want to we want you to have a strong connection with your friends. Um, and then usually the other two pillars are specific to the game. Uh, so for us, it was like, snappy and satisfying interaction, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then the other one was the joy of food. And the joy of food encompassed things like, I wanna make food that I like. I wanna make food that I know how to make and crave and wanna snack on. Um, but yeah, those are the, the pillars that we had, um, at least in the later stages, once we kind of figure out what this game was more about. Ooh. So sorry. But it's, uh, no worries. Um, so yeah, more questions. So do players get frustrated if they're in a winning team and someone joins in mid-match and messes things up? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, so it depends. That's that's an another interesting question. So as I said, we try to like balance things out in like in the numbers. It's it's complicated. I don't know how much I can actually talk about that, but it, we, we balance them out more or less. Um, the thing with this is that some people do say that they're frustrated. Like some people is like, oh, I saw at the end that we had like two opponents instead of one. Um, but in reality, most people actually are not playing like super competitively. So if they win, it's more like, a, ah, I didn't win rather than like, oh, um, I, I didn't win. Um, it's, not, it's not the overcooked. Uh, leaderboard, right? It's far more casual than that. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we deal with it. It's like we try to do some balancing with like the numbers in the background, but we also just kind of can understand that there's going to be some imbalance because even if you play something like Halo or anything like that, even if you initially have like a, a full team on each side, there's people who like stop playing there's people who like rage quit or whatever with multiplayer you can't like you it's very difficult to have a perfectly balanced experience all the time it's kind of comes in with the with the genre right on that topic so how do you design for making the game feel challenging but also very fun for you know, the casual player. Yeah, this is interesting. So we actually have like different difficulties of levels. Um, this, you can see here, this is one of our most complicated levels. It's like the, the summertime ice cream level, which I personally like a lot because it has a day night cycle, which you can't see, but it's, it's there. Um, so this is one of our more complicated uh, levels where you, you have to do like more than four steps i think actually or like no the longest recipe is four steps and there's like multiple combinations uh the way that we do it is that we have different stages and they have different difficulties and the players can play whatever they want to play um in the beginning we kind of start like put them into the direction of a specific stage that we want them to play the simplest one so that they can get to grasp with it but then they can experiment with how much challenge they actually want from the game. Um, and I'm going to show you a thing later on, uh, probably. Uh, but basically what we decided to do is that um, you can play different levels against each other. So you can play the ice cream level against the burger level. And again, they're balanced with each other. So um, it doesn't matter what level you play. The, the values are going to be staying roughly the same, which is great because you can you can play something that is more challenging for you, and someone else can be playing something that is simpler, and then you know. Um, 
We never really focus too hard on a competitive experience, though, because we know that the most of our players aren't in for competition. So we're probably erring towards the easier side of things. Um, yeah. Got it. Well, there's a lot of questions coming in, but people are also interested to see how that links with machinations. So yes. I think we should proceed with the presentation and then leave the rest of the questions for the Q&A at the end. Sounds good. All right. So the whole relatable inclusive bit of this game is interesting. This is a, a wonderful Halloween art. Um, as I said earlier, we try to integrate a big range of uh, like cuisines and sometimes they're not even like strictly cooking. So uh, one of our fans favorite is this, uh, this level here called Potion Party. And it's like a Halloween themed level where you're making little like colored potions with like eyeballs in them. Um, I don't know, it's, it's the same mechanic, it's just, instead of making food, you're making potions with eyeballs in them. Um, but yeah, so what we tried to do is like give a good spread based on what we knew this uh, this would be. And actually we have like a new kitchen now, which is called uh, Tackle, Tackle Town. Um, because uh, a lot of our players wanted something with Mexican food. So we worked with uh, Snap Mexico to create Tackle Town. Um, and we launched it on Day of the Dead, which was uh, pretty exciting. Um, uh, we also try to have diverse uh, bots and customer NPCs. And when we do the art for the game, we do an inclusive um, picture of what that is. Um, and most of the time to represent the kind of players that we have. And something that it's not really a benefit, it's like it's a benefit, but it's not, it's not our thing to be proud of is we actually use Bitmoji. So Bitmoji is uh, a company that Snapchat has uh, um, acquired and they have the 2D avatar version. But now for all of the Snapchat games, you can integrate Bitmoji. And Bitmoji have a huge variety of customization options, which means that you pretty much have a character creator integrated for free. Um, and they, because that's the main thing that they're doing with the Bimoji, which is to make sure that they have a uh, variety and representation for everyone. We actually don't even need to, we don't need to do anything to get all of the benefits of all of that work that they've been doing. Uh, and that's great because the players can model themselves how they see themselves, um, rather than us, like making a very simplistic, um, character creator in a game, given that we're only, well, we're 16 people in the company, but actually I think the most people that have worked on Chef at one time is probably like seven. So, um, you know, it's not something that we could have done easily without their help. So that's how we try to stay relatable and inclusive. And as I said, um, we do try to focus on the US because that's our main market, but we do try to hit on other cultural touchstones as well. So um, another thing that we care for is this uh, connective, but not intrusive. So the way that we do this is basically through the virtue of being on Snapchat, you can communicate with your friends in chat. And this is how the chat looks like in um, in Snapchat and in Ready Chef Go, you uh, press a button and you get like your, your keyboard coming up and you can send a message that will then float on screen and then you have a conversation on top of the game. Um, this is done to be useful but not super disruptive. Um, you can't really do it during a game because typing and playing a game that is so intense at the same time doesn't really work. But we have all of these other like moments in between where you can talk to your friends and strategize and do all sorts of stuff. Um, and the game notification are actually used sparingly. Um, and they're never placed, uh, we never place shares in a place where you can't avoid them. Um, and this is because we don't want to force the players to do anything that they wouldn't want to do. 
Um, also, Snapchat are pretty, they feel pretty strongly about how frequently you can notify players. So all of their features that give you a direct notification, like a pop-up notification on the phone, are limited to a number of uses a day. Not that we would abuse that, but they really care for how for the integrity of how you communicate with your players. So this is something that we have kind of baked in, but we also, as, as a goal for us as a company, that's something we care about. So how do we know all of this stuff? Um, through the usual means, I would say, uh, we do like run A-B testing on features. So we've done live development like two-ish years um, and we do like general data gathering from different sources as well um, about our players. Um, then we have something that we call player insights and player insights is looking at the more qualitative side of data gathering. So we do like focus testing on different builds, especially when we're making like a big update or anything like that. Uh, we do um, polling for different marketing assets and we use pickful for that um, and we have an integrated communication channel in the game so we basically have a button that you press you say i want help and it, it takes you to a chat box where you can chat to someone uh, from the studio that will help you with your issue and then that person gives you a response and then they catalog your request um, and we can see them all coming in and then they get categorized if they're like similar. That's how we see like emergent bugs if they don't appear in the like sentry errors and everything like that. So we have multiple ways of getting communication with them. We also have a lot of player initiated feedback. I was telling you earlier about the tweet and everything. Um, but actually we also have a verified Snapchat account and players can follow us and befriend us and send us snaps and messages and stuff. Uh, we receive emails, uh, sometimes in unexpected places. Uh, never, never underestimate how easy you are to find uh, based off of one thing that you've done. Um, they will find you and they will tell you what they think about your game. Um, and then we also have a lot of other social media contacts. So we have a, a Twitter for the game and all sorts of stuff like that. So how does machination factor into this? Uh, I, that's how I look when I usually make my diagram. Um, so we identified the need to have a way to, um, in some way, prototype systems before we decide to go with them. Uh, so we use uh, machination to prototype usually smaller loops and systems rather than bigger things. Uh, we start with a specific question most of the time. Um, and so far, my experience with it is using it in live ops because we used it on Ready Chef Go, and Ready Chef Go have, has been in live ops since we started using it. Um, and for us, machination doesn't actually like surpass anything that we were using before. It's kind of like filling in a gap that we didn't have anything for, um, which is this whole like systemic prototyping thing. So. I have a little story for all y'all. Um, I discovered, I knew about machinations for a while, but uh, I haven't started using it until I think it was January of 2021, actually. Um, and at that time, uh, I was looking at tutorials of how to use it and what to do. Um, and I thought the best idea to learn it is to try to model our game in, in machination. So, uh, a quick overview of what we have. So in Ready Chef Go, we actually use like a card fusion system uh, to upgrade the kitchen machines that you have. Think Clash Clash Royale, right? You get uh, a certain number of cards and then you can like fuse them and you go to the next level. You pay some coin, you do some things, you, it gets upgraded, right? Um, with that, we have boxes, loot boxes basically. Uh, and these boxes have like different values. They have, you have like a cardboard box, a leather box and so on. And uh, depending on what box you get, the player wins um, like different cards of different rarities. 
You gain these boxes through playing. As I said, depending on the value of the box, you're guaranteed a certain number of cards of different rarities. And based on how useful that machine is, the rarity of that card goes up. Um, also, the rarity of the card affects many things, including how many levels you can, like how many level up you can do on a machine. Um, also, like how fast it scales in efficiency. So that's the setup. We have a card fuse system. We have loot boxes. Uh, you gain these loot boxes through play, and they give you cards. So this is where I'm going to show you a diagram. You can scan this wonderful QR code if you would like. Uh, but I would, I will actually just share my screen and show you that. Right. So this is this is not the original diagram because I became better at making diagrams, and you don't want to see the first one that I made. So this is this is a pretty simple system, right? The player plays a game, and then they have a chance to win and a chance to lose. The chance to win is slightly higher because we have bots in there and the bots are rubbish, pretty much. Um, when you win, you get uh, 20 tokens, is what we call them. And when you lose, you get 10, right? Um, these tokens progress you on a victory road, is what we call it. Every time you reach a milestone on the victory road, you get a box. Now, you don't actually get a box every 30 uh, tokens, but this is for simplifying the idea because it doesn't actually matter for this example how many you spend before you get a box. So you get a box, and this box can be one of the four types of boxes that we have right here. And in our game, they, they are given out more or, or less in order. So you get a cardboard box, a leather box, a silver or a gold, and then they go back to the start. Pretty simple. Um, from each of these, you have a certain amount of guaranteed cards of certain rarities. So for example, the cardboard one is guaranteed to give you one common card. The leather one is guaranteed to give you two uh, common cards and one rare card. Also, you notice that I took out the uncommon card because I didn't feel like they were distinct enough. So we only have common, rare, and epic, and legendary. And so on. Yeah, the silver one gives you three common, two rare, and one epic. Then the gold one gives you three rare two epic and one legendary. Now, if we are to run this, it's gonna, we're gonna see something hopefully quite interesting. <laughs> so this is not a one-to-one -one system, but it's not far off. The player would keep playing and they're gonna win or lose based on the chances. And then this is gonna like determine how quickly they're getting boxes. And then those boxes are gonna get split into different, uh, Oh, I actually should probably show you why this is not. <laughs> actually, I, I, I'm sorry, I should have thought about this. So I thought I could trick you a little bit by not showing you the next bit, but I, I, I can't. So basically, what I've done here is this is the overall number of how many common cards are, how many rare cards are, how many epic cards are, and so on. Um, and you will see that if I run this, how many upgrades are actually done for each of the different types of, of cards. Um, I will tell you for free, um, what I wanted to show you without like showing you the entire diagram is that the common and rare cards are given out, are given out almost as frequently making them not actually of different rarities. Um, and we didn't realize this because it, it, when you look at the, the data, it doesn't look like that's what's going to happen, but it is. So you can see here that actually because of how many 
common cards are made and how many uh, rare cards, you end up making more upgrades for the rare cards than you do for the common cards, which ultimately makes them less rare. <laughs> um, this is not the case for this other ones, even though like for the legendary one, you have only one legendary card, or we did for that point in time. It's because it's not given out as frequently. But these two clearly have a problem. <laughs> um, and we couldn't have, it was very difficult to be able to tell that uh, without having a structure like this, where it does like an unbiased calculation. Um, so what we had to do is like, we had to reconsider how rare and common cards are giving out and when, because the number of how many you have meant that you end up making more upgrades here. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the diagram um, that I've built for you. I, again, it's not quite the diagram you use. I'm sure I've made some like more complicated, like needlessly complicated diagram initially. But yeah, you can see here that uh, when we ended, we ended up with like 29, 29, 12, and 15. When I've run this before, I've had situation in which this was actually quite a lot higher than the common one as well. So um, um, yeah, not something you necessarily desire. Um, yeah, so that was the diagram. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, this is my final slide. Uh, and it's good because I've been talking your ears off and uh, I've heard that you have many questions for me. So if you're looking to catch me on like anything like LinkedIn or Twitter, here's my LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, you can go on mojiworks.com uh, to see kind of what we're doing. And uh, if you would like to email me personally, um, that's my email. Um, and you can ask me questions, but um, based on how busy I am, I might take some time um, to respond. Thank you. Amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. And while we have you here, we're gonna mm. continue with the questions if that's okay. Yes, yes, please. All right. So um, is it risky following established hits in the cooking genre or did you see it as a safer bet due to their success and due to the fact that you're on a different platform? Um, I think, well, so it's, it's an interesting, it's definitely an interesting question, right? Because I personally, initially I was like, oh, why, why would people want to play this game rather than they would like to play a different game? Um, especially since there's so many like very popular cooking games on on mobile and overcooked exists and stuff like that uh, but then i realized that actually um it was more about the platform uh than it was about um being similar to other games and we didn't set out to make a clone of any of the other games we set out to make a game that really worked for the platform and for what we were trying to do uh, that's why we made so many like strange decisions with multiplayer and all that um and I think we ended up with something that people liked for where it was, you know, like um, platform matters a lot. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie and say that we didn't take inspiration quite heavily from a lot of these games, um, but in a way them being so like well-known and established um, helped us like focus on the things that we were innovating on. Uh, we didn't have to like answer how you do an order or how you do the interaction. We can focus on multiplayer and all of these other questions that none of the competitors, if you want to call them that, has solved because they weren't on the same platform. So that's something that we try to do most of the time with games is that we we take things that are established and we innovate where we care about most. And for us is this like the platform and the social. Um, and I, I think we did that with this game. Awesome. So we have two final questions. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is, 
how do you balance different size teams if there are four players and an opponent you know is only one player do they just get outpaced and is it just a numbers balancing and do you guys actually encourage players to invite their friends by offering rewards uh we do encourage people to invite their friends but no we don't offer rewards in the same way because it's like a it's an instant thing we don't say like oh invite your friends and you're gonna um like earn 50 coins or something like that uh, for us everything is a lot more like on in the moment so something that we actually benefit from is that if you play in a conversation so a conversation is when you and i are speaking together already and i decide to start a game inside the conversations that's how games work in snapchat and then you get a notification as soon as i play and that incentivizes you to join me um it's like an immediate thing and all of our thing all of our in or all of the ways that we try to incentivize the players are pretty immediate. Um, I don't know if I can really go into the nitty gritty of how we actually balance things, but we basically have all sorts of like multipliers that we have discovered across time by gathering data from people playing against each other. Um, so it's actually like it's it's done automatically. I don't even like it's not it's not something that I do. <laughs> it's we use data to to decide what multipliers are, and then we use those um, pretty much. Got it. Um, and final question is related to Bitmoji, actually. Oh, yes. Uh, so first, do, do you guys have a partnership with Bitmoji, or is it like an API that you just integrate? And are there a lot of Snapchat users already using Bitmojis? Yeah. So. Uh, we don't get figures exactly on how many people use Bitmoji, but we know that they're pretty popular. So most people on Snapchat do have a Bitmoji. Um, and about how we use it, we don't have a partnership with Bitmoji. It's one of the, if you are on Snapchat, it's one of the things that you can call and they give you a connection to uh, the physical uh, aspect of that Bitmoji. It's something that the player needs to agree to. So you have um, something popping up saying like, hey, this game would like to access your Bitmoji. Are you okay with that? I know, however, and this is not, it's not really what we're doing, but I know that now they're having this thing which is called Bitmoji for games. And that is different from what we use because we get it through virtue of being on Snapchat. And it's a lot easier for us because it's we have a partnership with Snapchat and they offer us APIs that we can call to do all sorts of things, right? Um, but there is a way to get Bitmojis into other kinds of games. But unfortunately, I'm not very knowledgeable about that. Uh, I know that they've been pushing it to, to be more widespread. And I actually, even if, you, even if it feels like it's not super plausible, um, I would actually just contact um, the, the Snapchat Europe team to see what they have to say about that um i know that they they are pretty um like they like to pick their partners um at, at least when it comes to snapchat uh snap games is a closed platform so they actually don't you can't as an indie you can't just make a game and publish it like you would on like steam or the app store or anything like that um but if in the interest of like collaborating with them like, yeah, definitely contact them. Again, I don't know a whole lot about Bitmoji for games as in like other games, but yeah, it, it's it's a thing, it exists. Awesome. Um, so we're out of questions, but I wanted to thank you again for joining us today and giving yeah. such a fantastic presentation. Um, I wanted to thank everyone in the audience as well for joining us, uh, for some people disconnected in the middle. Some people were asking if there's a recording. There will be one. It'll go up in a in a, in a week or so uh, on our official YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. And, yeah, thank uh, you so much for listening to me. Uh, I know that was like quite in depth, um, but I hope that I brought something interesting to the table. For sure. I, I found it very, very informative. And I, I, I even had my own questions. And thank you for 
for answering and taking the time to answer all the questions. And uh, yeah, so Ioana is a member of the Machinations Expert Club as well. Uh, the Expert Club is working with us to ensure that you know we continue to build machinations as the dedicated game design and balance platform um, and they're always giving us feedback and suggestions and they're very active on our discord server as well so you can join us on the discussions happening over there and uh on that note uh i think we'll we'll close down thank you Ioana. thank you everyone Bye. for joining us today thank you